switching gears just a little bit. Uh, tomorrow is Martin Luther King Day. And it's a a day of incredible significance. I think that um, history will prove out in the, in the decades and the centuries to come that, that it was a turning point for our country and that uh, to celebrate is honorable and good and right. One of the things that I didn't realize about that great I Have a Dream speech, this is one of the one of the things that I forgot. So I'm going to do it by memory. Is that that speech was given 100 years, not to the day, but about 100 years after, uh, I believe it was the Gettysburg Address. I never had clicked those two together. And yet, they so beautifully go together. Uh, the I Have a Dream speech is powerful and beautiful and wonderful. And I've printed out a little uh, pamphlet, flyer, whatever you want to call it. And it's on that back. It's in the in the foyer on that cabinet right behind the, the glass where Archie's sitting right there. Uh, and I would I would encourage you to take that home and read through that. It's got a little bit of background, and it's got the I Have a Dream speech. It is just beautiful and powerful and wonderful and meaningful. Um, and instead of me just babbling on about it, we've got a, we've got a, I, th I believe a great video that really helps us to center on and remember what that day and what that time was all about and the great hope that Martin Luther King was calling us to. Martin Luther King Jr. was calling us to. In that speech, you'll find that as he's wrapping up towards the end, he talks about his faith, that God will intervene, that God will come through. And he says, I will carry that hope back with me to the South. That is exactly what trust is. That we see what needs justice, that we see what needs God's intervention that we stand up and fight where we can and that we trust God and with great confidence and hope in God and God's intervention, we move forward with his great goodness, knowing that he will, in his time when it is right, he will intervene. Uh, it, it is an incredibly beautiful speech, and I, I would again encourage you to, to pick that up because it really goes along really goes along with our idea of trust. Things weren't good when he was out talking and he paid the ultimate price, but he carried forward in the hope in that rock solid confidence that God would intervene. All right. <clears throat> so there's a handout of the, I have a dream speech in the foyer and also in the foyer, there's a handout of, uh, the banner and the meaning and the symbolism in the banner that's also on that back um, cabinet there. It's in two sizes because I accidentally printed the 11 by 17 first and didn't know, didn't remember that I had, I, had done, I did it on 11 by 17 so that I could look at it and I could write it up and I could kind of, you know, think it through better and better and make sure that I covered everything. And then I, Forgot to transfer it down to an eight and a half by eleven. So there's both sizes up there. So if you really, really like it, take the big one. Otherwise, you can just have the other one. <laughs> so we are talking about has been has been brought up trust. What is biblical trust? We know what it means in our day and age, but it, like so many other words, when God gets a hold of it, He changes it, He deepens it, He He makes it beautiful like an old rusty worn out car that's been overused but somebody that knows what they're doing the master craftsman gets a hold of it and restores it to this pristine even better than new beauty and functionality and this is one of those words that god has done that with trust in the old testament the word is botach I love Old Testament words. I'm terrible at pronouncing them, actually, but it's a great, great word. 
it's translated as trust. But in the Old Testament scriptures, and again, remember the Old Testament scriptures and understanding, it's what the apostles were teaching on and, and what they understood. That was their foundation and their basis. So when Paul writes about trust in Romans 15, one of our theme scriptures, he's using, he's standing on this understanding of trust. So throughout scripture, the word trust has that incredibly significant focus of hope. That rock solid, I know it to be true, belief that God is present, is active, and will intervene. As we talked about last week, it was the great hope of of the Israelites in slavery for centuries that God would intervene. God would free them. God would take them to the land that he promised. Generation after generation, that hope, that trust was passed down. And I got to be honest, I'm a lot like Dale. I don't, I don't know. Had I been in, in, one of those generations that was still a hundred years out from, from God's rescue, would I have passed that along to my children? Or would I have looked back at the previous generations and gone, he hadn't come through yet. What's he waiting on? I mean, I'm just trying to be honest. This is not an easy concept to really grasp and to really live, but that's what we're called to do. If we're really going to believe that God is God, we really have to trust him in this depth. And that's hard to do. I think it's one of the beautiful mysteries of why we come together. To remind each other that this trust is real. And that we share stories of life and how God has intersected in our lives so that when I'm needing an a God intersection. I gain hope from hearing about your God intercept, inter, interception, intervention, intercession. And so we stir one another up. We, we encourage one another. We feed one another. We see the power and the beauty and the mystery and the movement, movement of God in one another. And it gives us hope for tomorrow. Well, along with hope, right there in the middle of this idea of trust is that confidence. And I've really spoken about it already. God will intervene. God is here. God is real. God is working towards justice. And when I say justice, I mean all the levels of justice. And for God... The main idea is that love and kindness win. That his kingdom, as he designed it, centered around flowing out of love and kindness. The victory is there. And it is secure. We just have to have great hope and patience and trust until we get there. In the first century church, they were eager eager to have Jesus come in and take them home. That final bell, let the race be finished. And then in Revelation, they're challenged, encouraged to hang on to the hope that God wins this fight, that God triumphs over evil, that God's victory is real and secure. And whatever price you have to pay to see it through, to be steadfast in your faith, pay it. It is worth it. And I believe that's the same call for us today. All right. Last week, we set a background for Psalm 37, a foundation for Psalm 37, an understanding for Psalm 37. And it was that idea that God 
will come through. That you can, that we can hope and trust that he will intervene, that he is present. He understands what's happening. He's involved in what's happening. And he is moving even now to bring his kingdom into play and that victory into reality. So now let's get into the text. But before we do, I want you to join me in a game of opposites. Now, this is a game that we're all familiar with and used to. And I'm going to say a word and you say the first word that pops into your mind. And we're going for opposites here. So I'm just going to start it out with black. Very good. Up. Good. Right. I was waiting for somebody to say left. Okay. Stop. Drought. It took a minute, didn't it? Yeah, flood. Flood, rain, either one. I'll take either one. Inside. Neat. Young. Hey, what are you saying? On. Fast. New. Isn't it weird how old worked twice there? That was easy, right? This idea of opposites is a great teaching tool, a great psychological and therapeutic testing and training method. It's also a great memorization tool. And all these things play into Psalm, Psalm, Psalm 37. Psalm 37, by way of reminder, is an acrostic psalm of Proverbs. It doesn't have any real flow to it in terms of building towards a lesson. It's a series of incredible proverbs strung together. And they're con contrasting good and evil, right and wrong, kingdom living versus selfish living, eternity's values versus humanity's values. As I said, there's no real flow to this psalm. Rather, it's more like, as I said last week, a beautiful necklace made up of a multitude of gorgeous beads, purposefully designed and held together by a strong common thread. And Psalm 37's common thread that brings these acrostic, this acrostic series of Proverbs together is justice for the righteous, for the trusting, for those who are doing God's good. It's a word of advice to not get caught up and fooled by the success of the evil ones, the non-faithful ones, to not get caught up in, in the glamour and glitz of what they are receiving because the end is much worse for them. And justice is and will come. God is watching. God is in control. And God will intercede, and he will bless the righteous and the faithful and the trusting when the time is right. Now, I've got to be honest. In Psalm 37, I was looking through it, and I've been wrestling with it for several weeks and outlining it and, and looking at things. And, and, and every once in a while, on, on the side of the page, I'll write, ooh, interesting sermon. Ooh, sermon idea. There's 12 of them. We're not going to get all of them today. I'm going to try to stick with the poster and what the, the, the theme and try to get a feel for what trust is in this psalm, which is, by the way, central. So let's jump in. Let's start in verse 1, even though it's not a part of verses 3 through 7, because we have to put this in context in order to get the real beauty out of what is on our poster? What is our theme scripture? Fret not yourself because of evildoers. Now, interesting word, fret, has to do with burning. Don't let your anger burn. Don't let your desire burn because of evildoers. Don't let your jealousy burn. Do not be envious, jealous, zealously, zealously envious of wrongdoers for they will soon fade like the grass. Now, that word fade is really interesting. It can also be translated and is translated in Scripture as circumcised. 
for they soon will be circumcised like the grass. It's also translated dried out. Again, Hebrew is an incredibly picturesque language. And so depending on the context, that picture changes and morphs because you've got different perspectives. So this word is translated in Scripture as fade, circumcised, dried out, cut off, death, loss of biological life. So they will soon fade like the grass and wither, which shrivel, wither like the green herb. Now that's the introduction. That's the psalmist laying it out. Isn't that very Jewish? When you hear Jewish folks speak, and this is true throughout the centuries, they often speak out of the negative. A great compliment might be, well, at least you're not an idiot. Thank you. And so in this teaching psalm, beginning again, at the acrostic going A to Z, only the Hebrew letters version of that, says don't get caught up, don't get jealous, don't get envious, don't let your heart burn for what these people have or against these people that are wildly successful, but that don't follow God. Because the end of what they have is of no value. Oh, you know one other one that I should have put in the opposites game? Heads, tails. Two sides of the coin. That's what David is doing in this collection of Proverbs. It ain't all that when you really think it through. And we hear stories of this all the time. Children that grew up in Hollywood, famous, making movies. How many of us think Lindsay Lohan is happy deep inside? Britney Spears before her. Even a great comedian like Robin Williams struggled mightily until it finally took his life. Tim Keller shares a sermon for a friend of his who works with very rich and very famous actors, describes them as the most miserable people on earth. Howard Hughes is quoted as being asked, how much is enough money? His answer was one dollar more. Never happy, never content until it took his life. Wealth and power and status and glamour do not feed the soul. That's why our song of invitation is Psalm 23. God feeds our soul. God cares for us and nurtures us and feeds us and brings us a satisfaction that the world cannot give. I mean, for century after century, millennia after millennia, humans have pursued wealth and glory and status, and it never has it worked. Why do we fight so hard to capture something that is as empty as those things? Well, that's how David starts the psalm. And there's something incredibly important to remember. And it's something that I'm going to call the great assumption. The great assumption in this psalm, and I believe the great assumption of all Scripture, is that God is absolutely sovereign. He is the ultimate value of all of life. He is the energy, the force, Star Wars fans, the power that is life, that gives life, that intercedes in life. He is the one to bring about good. He is the one to bring about justice. 
He is the great and perfect wisdom for the best life and the best of life. He is the final victory, and he is the current victory. Now, with all that in mind, now we can dig into verse 3. And I'm going to give you a little, I told you it really wasn't, there wasn't much of a flow, but I'm going to use a flow today. Verse 3, verse 5, verse 6, verse 7, trust, trust, he will, you be still. Okay? Trust, verse 3, trust in the Lord and do good. Trust Yahweh. And actually in the Hebrew, it's Yahweh trust. Trust in Yahweh. And do good. What is do good? Do good is righteousness. That's what righteousness means throughout Scripture, to do God's good. It doesn't mean my righteousness, my shining star, my look at how many times I've been to church and I'm better than you. My, I have my Bible and I'll beat you over the head with it if I want to. Doing God's good. Feeding the hungry. Caring for the sick. Expressing God's kindness in the life that he has put you in. Where you are. Be kind, even when your enemy is spitting in your face. Remember, they did that to Jesus. Plus, they punched him out. Plus, they beat him with basically a baseball bat while they were putting a crown of thorns on his head. Then they nailed him to a cross to suffocate to death. And he still said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. That's the kindness of God in life that we are to exercise. Not easy, but if you trust God, you do good. Dwell in the land. Remember, we talked about land last week, where land is one of these picturesque pieces of Hebrew poetry that is a reminder of God's promises. God promised them the land flowing with milk and honey. And he's saying, dwell in the land that God promised you. Dwell in the promises of God. Dwell in the character of God, in the life of God, in the reality of God. That is the land of plenty. That is a land that will not fade like the grass, that will not wither like the green herb. Dwell in God's country and befriend faithfulness. I think the NIV says, enjoy good pasture or something to that effect. They, they stay with that land metaphor, but the ESV, I believe, is more on target here and more literal, certainly. But this is the idea that God, that the writer here, God through David, is bouncing back and forth between the metaphors of his promises and the reality of his promises. Befriend faithfulness. I love that phrase. And one of these days, we're going to have a sermon just about that phrase, but we don't really have time today. So, in a nutshell, befriend faithfulness. A good friend works on a friendship. It's like in a good marriage, you have to work on that marriage. You pay attention to each other. You feed each other. You bless each other. That's how it's got to be, or the friendship, the marriage is going to fade. You have to work at it. You have to put time into it. You have to put effort into it. That's what he's saying. Befriend faithfulness. Do good. Be righteous. And feed it. Feed your faith. Be a friend to your faith. Walk with your faith. Challenge your faith. Keep your faith honest. Grow your faith. Deepen your faith. And then he says, delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the, the desires of your heart. One of the most misunderstood scriptures in all of scripture. And we're not going to talk about it today. But it does not mean if you want a new motor motorcycle, be happy in the Lord. That's not what it means. Okay, it's all about perspective and it's all about what do you, in fact, we've had a couple of sermons on this. I think I called it whatever, you know, contrasting the whatever that, that teenagers often say to their parents, present company excluded, and looking God face to face and saying, whatever you want me to do. Jesus, prayer in the garden. Not my will, but yours be done. When our heart is in that place, then he gives us the desires of our heart because they are the desires of his heart. 
It's David, borrowing from Dale's table talk, going to King. What was the king's name? Saul. Yeah. Jeez. Going to King Saul. It's great getting older. And saying, I'll fight this guy. He said, what are you talking about? You're a kid. I fought the lion and the bear while I was protecting Pop's sheep. I ain't afraid of him. God's here. Good enough for me. When that's the desire of your heart, to serve and to do good, then God comes through. Verse 5, here's our second trust. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust him and he will act. Did you hear that? Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him and he will act. That word for commit can also be translated petition. Petition the Lord. Seek the Lord. Go for it. Be committed to it. Trust in him. That batach word, that great word that's full of hope and confidence. And he will act. He repeats himself. I mean, that phrase is a definition of trust. Commit your way to the Lord and he will act. That's trust. I believe in him so deeply that I'm going to do whatever he says to do, whatever he teaches me to do, whatever he leads me to do, because I know that he is in the midst of it and he'll take me through it. It's Ephesians 2.10, just reworded. God's in the midst of preparing good works for us to do. Do we trust that? Do we trust that that's who God really is? And if we do, then we can go confidently forward because he is with us and preparing the way, and it's already a done deal. Trust. Trust. He will. He will act. And then, verse 6, he will bring forth your righteousness as the light. Again, this is not that badge of honor that says, look at how great I am. It's he will bring those good works into the light of the dawn. It'll be a new day dawning for those that you bless with God's love and God's interaction and God's intercession. Your righteous deeds, again, will be brought into the light, not for your own glory, but so that others will receive the goodness of God and realize the depth of God's goodness and hunger for him and begin their own journey, trusting the Lord and doing good. He will bring forth your righteousness as the light, the light of day, the, the first beautiful exposing light, the light of hope, the light of direction. The light that brings color back to life. It's the light of dawn. And your justice, your rightness, your judgments, your goodness is the noonday sun, as the brightest light of the day. That when we do good because we trust the Lord, when we befriend faithfulness because we know God is good, when we decide to delight ourselves in the Lord and he begins to work in us and through us to do these good works that we so want to do for his glory and for his kingdom, when we commit ourselves to him, he begins to act. And when he begins to act, we change the world and the perspective and the understanding of others. Not that we change it, but that God's love flowing through us, working in us, changes it in their perspective, in their eyes, and they can enjoy the goodness and the beauty and the love and the kindness of God. And then he says in verse 7, be still before the Lord. Oh, as a preacher, this is one of, this is a hard one for me. As a youth minister, it was miserably difficult for me. There's always more to do. I remember when I first was offered the, the work at, at, uh, at Southeast, um, Wow, a long time ago. 
Uh, Twyla and I went to lunch with the preacher and his wife, uh, Charlie and Nancy Kimes, wonderful, wonderful people of God. And one of the pieces of advice that he gave us, and I was glad he did it in Twyla's presence because he actually said, and don't, don't let him do this. Number, don't get the big head because you're doing God's work. He says, there's always more to do. There's always, you can't do it all. You're not designed to do it all. But don't get so caught up in doing God's work that you neglect God's work at home. That's your first God's work. I believe one of the holiest, most beautiful, most sacred jobs in the world is to be a mother and a father and to love and bless your kids and your grandkids. That's holy ground stuff. And that has to be taken care of first. And here I was, this 20-something, so excited to get this job and get to do God's work all day long. 365, 24-7, blah, 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 whatever. And here's this preacher saying, don't buy into the lie. God's work is good, but you can lose your way very quickly. And it's something that I've had to fight. I'm so grateful that we on trek, one of the the day before you hit summit, you get to high camp, and then the whole next day, it's time with God day. You have breakfast together, you sing a couple of uh, hymns together. You know, you just you're just so excited to reach this summit, and then you have to go and spend three hours not speaking a word. just silently sitting with God. I, year after year, I start out in prayer, right? I mean, you got to. Not out loud, but, you know, in my head. And after 20 minutes, I have prayed for every person and all of their animals that I could think of. And then I got nothing. And this is just me and God. Bare naked, 13,000 feet up in the air. And the next two hours and two and a half or 10 minutes are miserable because you're really trying to hide from God. Because when you finally get to that point where you just say, okay, God, speak. I can be scary. But it can also be Beautiful. feeding and enriching and challenging and cleansing. And so I try now to be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. But I'm not good at it. I want to get better at it. And I hope that I share this with you because I'm hoping that you're joining me on that journey. We all begin to carve out real time in our day, in our month, somewhere along the line, to just spend some time with God in silence. It is life-forming. It really is. It's sitting down on the potter's wheel and taking this clay body and washing it with water so that it is pliable and soft and saying, God, if you will, spin that wheel and shape me. Well, that's our psalm. That's our theme scripture. Isn't that a great theme scripture? I forget who came. Does anybody, any of the elders remember who came up with that? With that one? Anyone? I would love to give credit where credit's due because it's just. I think it was Dr. Dave. It would not surprise me. But we got a good group of guys, so it wouldn't surprise me. And gals, by the way, when we meet now, it's it's elders and ministers all. How many does that make? Eight of us. And we get things done. Strange. 
It wouldn't surprise me who came up with that, of that group, for sure. Trust. Trust Yahweh. Trust in Yahweh. He will act. He will move. You, me, be still and wait patiently for him in our everyday life and in those moments when we are waiting for his justice and it seems like it's taking forever. Martin Luther King Jr. died before he saw any real change take place. And yet look, I'm not saying we're there, but look how far we've come. Generation after generation after generation of Israelites died waiting for God's intervention and justice when they were slaves in Egypt. They passed down that hope, that trust, that confidence, and God moved beautifully and powerfully. Praise team, come up, please. All this operating under the basic assumption, the great assumption that God is absolutely sovereign, that he is the ultimate value of all of life, that he is the energy, he is the force, he is the power that is life, that gives life, that intercedes and is intertwined in life, and he brings about good and justice. He is the great and perfect wisdom, for the best life. He is the final victory. He is the current victory. And he has invited us and chosen us and favors us. And we need to dwell in that more and more. God favors us. This is a God that we can trust. He is moving and will intervene for his causes and for his beloved people. And we are his. His servants, his children, his creation, his recreation. And we joyfully get to represent his name and bring honor to that beautiful name and bring his presence into play, into the places that we go, into the things that we do. And it happens more and more beautifully and more and more powerfully and more and more effect effectively the more and more we trust his faithfulness, his goodness, his kindness, his love, and his presence in our lives and in this world. So let's live life on the higher ground of trust. Let's trust that he is our great shepherd. You may remember this from last week. And trust that he is feeding us, that he is nourishing us, that he is protecting us, that he is leading us. Because in God's hands, in God's kindness, in God's kingdom, we have everything and so much more that we can rejoice in the knowledge, in the rock-solid knowledge that God, that we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I love that closing line of Psalm 23. We will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And that forever has already begun. Let's sing.